those. Sorry to keep you waiting. Um, this is Charles. Charles is a fantastic developer with a lot of knowledge. Uh, he'll be going over domain-driven design. Um, I find it super interesting. I hope y'all will find it super interesting. Also, if you were part of the last session with Gavin, this is a great um, kind of follow-up session to join. Um, Charles, I'll let you go ahead and take it from here. Yeah, for sure. Um, yeah, Gavin's a colleague and yeah, uh, hopefully this will be a good follow-up for his presentation. So, um, all right, awesome. Good morning, everyone. Um, my name is Charles Vito and I'll be presenting um, about domain-driven design. Uh, hopefully y'all had a good time so far during um, uh, this entire morning for Dow Startup Week and the following presentations should be also pretty top tier. Um, the purpose of this talk is just to serve as a simple introduction into domain-driven design. It's not gonna be going into depth, it's kind of breadth first search. Kind of deal like we're, go we're going into nerdy territory right now um but hopefully this will encourage you to explore more into it and see if that's something that your team can adopt and if it can, you can leverage it to deliver value quickly and you know um, without um, any mistakes so I'll, I'll do my best to keep it simple and i'll try to power through it all right so next slide Cool. So again, um, Charles Vito, I'm a software engineer at Asterisk as well as USA. Uh, I do have to do like the usual disclaimer. Uh, I am not representing USA within this presentation. Um, and uh, I'm just here as part of Asterisk, uh, also as part of myself, um, very much an architectural geek. Um, so at Asterisk, uh, I kind of fulfill an architectural role within our team. Um, so I'm a primary facilitator for technical discussions about our product and what we're trying to deliver you know, um, as a tech product. Um, you know, requirements gathering, domain modeling, all sorts of different things. So it kind of aligns um, more on the like the business processes side of things. Uh, so definitely like whenever you're doing a discovery phase um, before you do delivery, that's where we, we kind of um, uh, focus on. So uh, let me go ahead and go to the next slide. All right, dope. cool. So why DDD, why domain-driven design? So typically, um, before writing any code, uh, what D the premise of DDD is to make sure we model, we discuss, and we shape our core domain, uh, emphasis on core domain, uh, together with the people that we that know it inside and out. Um, the people that know it inside and out, they're known as domain experts. And this collaboration between technical experts, so like the tech team, or what's also known as delivery team, and these domain experts, whether it's like sales, marketing, um, you know, like, uh, like just people who own the um, experiences in the product and just know inside and out, these domain experts will help the team iteratively refine a conceptual model that addresses a particular domain's problems. Um, so like as developers, sometimes we're used to thinking in CRUD, like create, read, update, and all that stuff. Um, but real world problems, um, they're non-trivial. Um, they don't necessarily map to those verbs one-to-one. -one. You kind of have business processes and like special bits of policy that you're trying to enforce. and Domain driven design tries to is like um, kind of guardrails for that. So um, and there's a quote from uh, you know Exxon Medium article because that's where we source all our information. Medium um, software is made to solve problems. Software written within the DD mindset doesn't shy away from that fact. So again, it's putting the core domain, the core problems up front and center, making sure that that's the language that you write it. Um, so uh, this talk is kind of divided into three topics. Um, whenever you read kind of literature on uh, domain driven design, it's also kind of split up in this fashion. So you have the philosophy, uh, what is the premise of DDD, how it helps us and whatnot. I kind of touched a little bit on that, but I'll expand on it. Uh, strategic design, so how to discover or rediscover your core domain. So it's like a top-down approach. You kind of like analyze your process, see what like happens and whatnot and you kind of um, establish what's known as a ubiquitous language. And I can, and I'll get into that once we get there. Um, and um, the next one, uh, which is a little bit, you know, more nitty gritty, uh, something that like tech people really like going into is the tactical design, like how to implement and map your domain into your code base. So hopefully with these three topics, um, you kind of have a roadmap of what to look for and like what you might be interested in and you pick and choose what you need. Um, but going to go for the philosophy. So the first bit of the, um, and the main like premise of uh, domain driven design is making sure that everyone's on the same page. Um, I can't tell you the amount of times where, you know, you start a project and everyone has their own different interpretation. So you kind of have to establish and build 
what's known as a ubiquitous language. Um, all it is is a common set of terms and definitions used by uh, the entire team, both tech and non-tech, and everyone must speak it. Like That's pretty important, uh, in my honest opinion. Um, it, it's important because um, developers um, need to understand the business problem in business terms, uh, and it allows them to communicate more clearly with the stakeholders um, uh, around you and amongst the rest of the technical team. So you don't introduce any like technical jargon, and uh, like, everyone's on the same page. Um, this, this business language will eventually be embedded into the code base as classes, commands, queries, and especially domain events. Um, like this command. Something that, uh, makes it really easy when someone like it, it reduces your bus factor. And if someone else, like a, a junior developer comes into the code base, they're trying to contribute. Uh, meaningful value. Um, they can just hop in. They just read it. They understand the business rules, um, or that's that's the hope. Um, you know, and and again, whenever you build this language, it needs to be built as a team. And then, uh, as an architect or a facilitator during these discussions, you have to make sure you do your homework before talking to domain experts and bringing people in, um, and make sure to use like real world scenarios to drive the understanding of the domain and to capture the problems as you discuss. So. Uh, so that is, if anything, that's the core tenet of domain driven design, making sure you establish that ubiquitous language. So just get everyone on the same page. That's step one. Um, you know, things that are kind of, you know, and aside from that, uh, it is model driven. So if, if the code isn't a model of the business domain, then what is it? Um, uh, typically, like if you're, if you're, if the model of your business is, is non-trivial, right? Like it's not only like create, read, update, um, typically. You know, you have like different entities and like objects or ideas of what these different things, like bits of information and everything surrounds a model. So, um, and then also uh, the last part of, uh, you know, as part of the philosophy and it's, you know, uh, kind of echoed in other paradigms like agile and whatnot. So it's a journey and it's not a destination. So uh, domain driven design is a continuous process, uh, much like in the previous talk where Gavin was saying that you kind of like it's kind of nonlinear or, or you kind of have to jump between different like points. Like you know, you're gonna have to iterate, you're, you have your prototypes, you're gonna have to go back to your customer, to the domain experts and figure out, I was like, hey, what's what's going on? Um, and it isn't easy. Like um, I don't want to sell you guys like snake oil or anything like that. This is uh, pretty hard uh, to do. Um, I mean, but that's why we do it. Uh, but yeah, and it tends to be worth the trouble. Um, so. Uh, one last aside for that is um, ideas and sticky notes are cheap. This is just like a quote I stole um, and code is expensive. So if we're able to iterate on these ideas and have like facilitation around it, we'll probably, there'll be less mistakes when we do implement and less changes if we have to. Um, so that's the core like philosophy of it. Um, let me just double check if there are any questions. All right, nope. All right, cool. So uh, the next part uh, or topic um, for domain driven design is like the strategic design. So um, these kind of like uh, are just different points of like or different ways to say the same thing. So setting up the right interactions, uh, discovering your core domain, and modeling is collaborative. All that means is that you have to meet, you have to collaborate, you have to talk with the people uh, and to the right people. Um, and typically, um, the best way to do that. Uh, especially in the remote environment, um, uh, remote or not, is through workshops or through like like very well facilitated um, interactions uh, between you and and everyone else in the team. Um, so making a workshop is probably going to be your best bet in order to gather your requirements. It makes more things digestible and everybody. And it provides a platform for people to put in input. Um, you make sure to invite um, your domain experts. That's the number one thing. Um, you want to invite your developers or technical leads or anything like that. You want to include your designers, uh, sales and all that. Um, so just be sure to include as many people as you can, um, but within reason, right? Like you can't invite like a whole company of 50 into one meeting or you can try, it might be interesting. Um, but especially with the caveat in virtual environments, it's really hard to bring extra people due to the communication limitations. So whenever you're doing this online, you kind of want to maybe limit it to like, or, a rule of thumb is like seven people, like five to seven. Um, but uh, it's whatever, you know, everybody's use case and context is a little different. So um, uh, pick and choose what you need. Um, so after you hold this workshop, um, whether um, 
and I should probably explain what the possible workshops are, uh, uh, what they can be. Um, uh, after you hold a workshop, you make sure to document your model, uh, document any like epics or, or anything, any notes, and share them with all the participants. And something that's probably really important to kind of call out is that this model is not really documentation, at least not yet. It's more of a memory aid for the participants and the representation of the domain. So it's just a representation of the conversations you had. So again, it's all about staying on the same page. Eventually, like it'll turn into documentation, it'll get into the code base, but not quite yet. Um, that's going to be in the technical side. Um, I did forget one slide. Yeah. All right. Cool. So yeah, making a workshop. Um, the best kind of meetings are when they are facilitated well and allows to, um, everyone to give input. Um, so my favorite one and the one that will be uh, upcoming after this uh, will be a demo of events uh, uh, storming. Uh, there's a typo there. Uh, event sourcing is a technical technique. Uh, event storming is a strategic one. So event storming, uh, the short of it is, is that you um, you kind of map out the process based on the state of facts that happen within your like product or or your experience, and then you build off this like you know what has happened, and then you find out what caused that thing to happen, the motivations why those things are happening. So it's a it's a very good discovery process. Um, I would just leave it you know uh, superficial here. Um, we'll talk about it more in the next workshop. Um, there's other. Um, um, facilitation techniques like domain storytelling and story mapping. Story mapping kind of is like if you already have the stories out there and you're just organizing. Domain storytelling is very in the same vein as events um, storming. But um, but just like you can, if you need to pull it off, like you can pull it off with slightly less people. Uh, it's, it's, it's more actor-based instead of event-based um, facilitation. So uh, again, I'll leave it up to y'all to do y'all's uh, homework on that. Um, no, I'm just trying to expose um, these different concepts. So um, the next bit is tactical design. So this is something that um, typically um, developers and architects, they, they tend to swarm around. And, they, and, and we tend to have um, heads down, a focus on stuff like this. Um, I think it's an, important to emphasize that um, we need to, as developers, make sure that we plan accordingly and that we uh, understand the motivations of why, you know, business is doing what they're doing, right? Uh, the motivations why, like, we are even building this product. And before you even, like, do anything tactical, you need to make sure you spend a good amount of time planning. Um, not not so much like waterfally, but, like, it, it needs to be, it needs to happen. Um, but there's three um, uh, aspects of tactical design. Um, well, there's more, but um, again, this is just breadth first search or breadth first. Um, so I just want to show it um, uh, is layered architecture. Um, so if you know you heard of onion architecture or like um, hexagonal architecture, this is very much the same vein of things. It's nothing new. It's it's been around for a while, uh, and a lot of these things are you're, we're just calling them out. Um, if you know your technical patterns, um, this won't be a surprise for you. Uh, you have your domain structures. Uh, these will be like, you know, and, and you have DDD patterns. Um, DDD patterns are the ones that I'm gonna kind of talk a little bit more about um, because there are some caveats, um, you know, some cautionary tales, but it's incredibly powerful. Um, so I'll go ahead and proceed. So with uh, layered architecture, um, there's four aspects. Uh, again, this is, uh, I'll probably breeze through this because this is something that uh, uh, most uh, people in the technical realm should um, be aware of. Um, is you have your uh, user interface, your uh, application layer, a domain layer, and an infrastructure layer. Uh, essentially, the user interface layer is almost like a dumb layer uh, that uh, responds to what's happening within the application. Um, you can do like um, essentially do two things, right? You're you're uh, displaying data, right? It's your read model. Um, so like whenever the front end will query the back end, you know that's what's happening. And then you're capturing user commands. So whatever their intent is, right? Their, their primary intent to cause something to happen uh, will be captured here, user interface. It can be an API, it can be a command line, it can be a traditional like web app, it can be um, a mobile app. It's it's whatever. It's it's just the user interface. So um, typically, um, uh, you do spend a lot of time here, like design and making sure that the, the experience is well. Uh, but it is on one of the thinner layers. Um, the application layer is an even thinner layer. It just coordinates like application activity, like sessions and you know, 
uh, authentication and whatnot and making sure that um, you're able to access um, um, core business logic, which will live in the next part called the domain. So this layer is the heart of where the business software lives uh, and is where the domain model lives. So whenever you're developing your models, each programming language has different ways to do it. You could do like functional style, object oriented style. Uh, typically domain driven design is more object oriented, um, but having a healthy mix of two paradigms is usually your best bet. Um, it, it's, um, it, it leverages different um, bits of infrastructure. So if you're familiar with like dependency injection and whatnot, this is kind of like that bit of logic. Um, so you have your, like your use cases live here, you have your policies live here. It can, um, you know, based on, you know, X, Y, Z, I want, um, you know, ABC event to emit. So this is, these are your business rules. And I can, um, in the advanced storming workshop, um, I can show how to like get these into stories and, and whatnot. Uh, and the last base infrastructure is just application utilities. It's persistence, messaging, all the supporting libraries. Um, uh, yeah, I, again, this one's pretty straightforward. Uh, if you look at some of the other paradigms or architectures, uh, they can be a little bit more complicated. Usually simpler is better. And this is the one that is pretty common in domain-driven design. So uh, the next things are domain structures. So um, you model your business, uh, at least within the code base, uh, using entities and value objects. So uh, I do want to kind of elaborate on this. So entities are essentially objects where the identity matters. It's uh, mutable. Uh, usually um, it, it, it has a life cycle that persists after it's used. So like if you are a user, you have a user ID, you are an entity, right? Uh, value objects are more like um, kind of like documents. They are ephemeral. They're immutable. They're they're kind of just used as like passing information as a layer. Like they could be, um, you know, bits of information that uh, is usually coupled together. Um, again, these are just fancy words for different types of objects where one is mutable and has an ID, and the other one's immutable, and you don't really necessarily care about its ID. So. Um, uh, the next bit um, is the repository. Uh, so you retrieve and store your entities, uh, factories. You can create entities that you can put your rules in there and like what's the criteria to create a user? Like uh, is this criteria fulfilled? Um, and then the next interesting part about domain structures is aggregates. So sometimes um, entities can get really complex and you have like different parts of information. Like for example, like you have geolocation you don't need an ID for a geolocation, but it is like a valuable object to have, uh, like when explaining like a user. So uh, you kind of kind of bind it into what's known as an aggregate. So you have all these different value objects and you tie it with an entity and then you have what's known as um, an aggregate that you can pull. And um, again, I, I recommend reading up on this. This is a little bit like hazy, in my opinion. A lot of people tend to get confused on what this is. It usually takes a lot of rereading. Uh, but essentially, it's just like a grouping of entities and value objects. Um, the next bit is um, uh, services. So usually, your your business logic should live within the entity. Uh, it's kind of like what's known as like a rich model versus an anemic model. I anemic models tend to give you issues. Uh, I, I would highly recommend reading up on them. Uh, so when you have a rich model, uh, it, like anything specific, for example, like a user, um, you want to couple it there. However, if there are things that uh, business bits of business logic that are not necessarily tied to only one type of entity. So let's say you have a user and you have like a notification and then you have like uh, like a product ordering, right? Like a, like inventory and whatnot. Uh, that kind of like um, your relationship, usually you want to have like a service kind of dedicated that uh, to facilitate that, and it's not tied to specifically one entity. Um, and the last thing uh, I think, which is really important, and what te um, you know, if you're paying attention to the architectural world and it's been around for a while, is the idea of events um, or domain events. So these are just published me messages. Um, they communicate when state of the business have changed, and this is probably one of the most powerful things to be able to have in your system. So whenever you're able to detect, like let's say a, a user ordered a product, you can, um, you know, uh, that event has emitted, and then like the sales team can maybe like follow up. Like it's it's something that is uh, nothing new. Um, there's many technologies to implement this: Kafka, RabbitMQ, you know, all, all sorts of different messaging uh, buses, and um, it's it's something to be worthwhile uh, to familiarize yourself. 
So, and then getting towards the end, uh, but uh, the last part is DDD patterns. So some of the common patterns align with domain-driven design. Um, one of them well, that maps quite nicely, it's a, uh, it's a technique to separate you know, um, business concerns is CQRS, so command query responsibility separation. All that means is that uh, you're decoupling the idea of uh, queries and like reads and writes. And um, the, uh, these operations are um, what's known as, uh, I mean, I'm, I'm blanking on it. Uh, eventually, uh, uh, eventual consistency, I, I'm forgetting the term, uh, but essentially uh, uh, when you do a command um, and, you, and you want to have like a query model uh, come back later, it's going to be um, eventually inconsistent. So after a few uh, moments, uh, this is like something what Facebook does, is that uh, you don't need to know exactly when you like you get your like right away. Um, so you you send a command and you won't like mutate any anything else. And then whenever you query, um, at that given moment you might not see the like, but uh, usually it's pretty fast. But it's making sure that the the transactions you do um, are are nice and clean. Um, CQRS is pretty good at making sure that uh, the code is smaller. Um, and I highly recommend that you read up on it. Uh, Microsoft has some good docs on it. Uh, it's pretty uh, advanced, but it's, it's pretty worth it. Uh, the next thing is event sourcing. Um, so the idea is to uh, very much like a bank account, like you have your transactions. So you're, you're essentially storing the events, the things that happen in your domain. And then you can derive your state from there. So you can create all sorts of read models for free, essentially. Uh, I should be careful when I say that. It's it's not always for free, but uh, you can uh, create projections and you can create uh, optimized read models for that particular uh, use case. And um, you don't have to worry about like uh, your models um, uh, changing. Uh, it makes your uh, models very uh, um, flexible uh, because, again, you're only storing the things that have happened and you derive the state from there. Uh, and the last thing is just a modular mon uh, monolith. So if you are a startup and you are going, uh, you know, like you might hear all these buzzwords for like, you know, microservices, serverless, and everything. Um, but the pendulum swings in the architectural world, and uh, it people tend to be, are, are going back to modular monoliths because the operational cost and and the ease of development is is there. Um, there are now like better techniques on developing monoliths, especially when you're starting up, uh, and uh, uh, if you if you're very deliberate and you're, you're doing it right uh, and you're slicing your your core logic into the appropriate subdomains of your of your business, um, it'll be easy to break out into microservices or even serverless functions. So um, and that's all that means. I, again, um, all of these topics are pretty uh, complex or, or they have a lot of depth to them. So hopefully this was just like an, um, an, a good exposure to that. Uh, let's see, I believe that's the last of it. Yeah, uh, so just to wrap things up, uh, I kind of want to uh, emphasize some key takeaways. Um, the The most important thing, if you were only to choose one thing, is to make sure you establish the, that ubiquitous language to keep everyone on the same page. Uh, it's super important for de like developers and designers to uh, reduce churn uh, uh, by making sure that they understand what business truly wants. And, and, and really the only way, in my opinion, you can do that is through um, very well-crafted facilitation. And usually that's through a workshop. It could be through a meeting, whether you have, like you make sure everything that you do is in the notes. There, there's so many different techniques, but making sure that you facilitate every interaction you have to gather requirements because you, you kind of don't want to be sitting in a round table and just like uh, spinning your wheels and everything, uh, because that that does it is draining for your team, and um, and it's not necessarily the best use of your time, especially when you're together, especially in this remote environment. Uh, it's really important to be able to facilitate, and um, and and then the last one is to focus on your core domain. Um, one thing I didn't get to touch on earlier, uh, I kind of just missed it, is that whenever you're exploring your domains uh, through this facilitation of workshops, you will get a whole bunch of different subdomains. So you get like um, something that's not necessarily, uh, uh, it's useful for your business, but it's not necessarily the core part of your business. Um, usually you can 
find services or, 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 or get external help for that. But when you're focusing on your core domain, like the core thing that makes your business run, uh, that's, that's essentially what you want to model for, discuss and refine and talk about. Um, so make sure to focus on that. I mean, it just makes things a little bit easier uh, and a little bit easy, uh, yeah, easier to digest uh, when developing code. All right, so uh, yeah, I just kind of went on a, a nonstop rant um, and that's it folks. If you guys have any questions, feel free to uh, post it on Slack. Uh, I'm gonna read through the, the, ch uh, the chat right now uh, really quick, just to see if I can answer it really quick, but I don't know how I am in time. Um, yeah, you're but... still you're still good on time. Um, any any questions? Any questions, people? And then also, um, Charles, do you want to let them know what the next session is? Because this this one was more letting them know about DDD, but then what's the next session that's up next? Yeah, for sure. Um, so yeah, as, as Kayla mentioned, this one again was just an introduction, and hopefully it would inspire you to like deep dive into it more and just look into it. Uh, I think it's worth it. But the next one is actually going through a uh, event uh, storming workshop. So going from uh, point A to point B on getting the requirements for uh, you know uh, what we're going to be uh, modeling and what we're going to be uh, trying to extract the requirements for is um, like an Uber clone, right? So we're going to essentially map out and, and get the um, requirements out of Uber and uh, see how we can um, take that and develop our models, just like the premise of Uber, and then we'll, we'll build it from the ground up. So hopefully it would be interesting. Uh, I highly recommend that you guys attend. Um, and uh, it's uh, Akila, if correct, uh, it's 11.20 or 11.25? Uh, 11.25. So yeah, okay. 11.25 is also with, uh, also with Charles um, leading it, um, but it's gonna be on a different, um, like it's it's technically a different section, so you have to go back to the track sessions and click the the event storming one. Um, but yeah, it's going to be uh, going to be more, I guess, of a workshop rather than um, rather than a a lecture. Yeah, yeah, it'll be a demo, and hopefully it'll be entertaining too. Um, it's a little, it's around the core lunch hours, so if you guys feel like eating through it too, um, by all means, uh, it's just like watching TV while you eat. So that would all be pretty uh -huh. dope. Um, also, we did have a question see, in here. Yeah. Yeah. So I, I, I saw two. Um, so one of them is like any good books or websites you recommend to learn more about domain driven design. So um, I don't know if you're familiar with the awesome lists on GitHub. So if you do awesome slash or you Google awesome slash whatever the concept is, you'll find pretty cool lists like awesome slash JavaScript, often slash awesome slash, um, you know, uh, Go, um, uh, awesome slash Kafka. There's one called awesome slash DDD. So if you can find that, it's a repository of all sorts of books and you know uh, concepts. Uh, what I'll try to post later, I do have my own notes. Uh, I'll try to publish them and get them down out in the Slack channel so you guys can reference that too. Um, uh, I, the, um, I, I should probably mention the history a little bit, but um, Eric Evans, uh, I think he coined uh, domain-driven design, the term, and he's written a few bo books. Also, Von Vernon. I believe that's his name. Um, yeah, I'll, I'll post some more resources out there, but yeah, awesome, awesome DDD on, on GitHub is probably the best place to go. Um, and then the last question is like, what uh, fun is technology? Uh, what fun is technology is you can't use to track it? I can't read that. I'm sorry. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, I'm not too sure. If you want to reiterate that question, I think it was a construct IO. And then uh, there was another one, asterisk solutions. Oh, okay. Uh, yeah, okay, Keila, you totally answered it. I got oh, okay. you, man. I got <laughs> you. And how can people also keep connected with you? Yeah. So. Uh, oh yeah, you got the LinkedIn. Never mind. I got, yeah, I see it. I'm yeah. I'm blind. I see your LinkedIn right here. <laughs> yeah, I, I am on LinkedIn. Uh, there, I also have a um, a website, but it's currently just uh, kind of a half big project at the moment. Uh, but I do have contact info there. It's just charlesbeedle.com. Uh, you can do uh, Charles Beedle. You can also email me uh, at charlesbeedle.dev at gmail.com, and then um, I can hopefully answer any questions or or point you in the right direction if you have anything related to domain-driven design. 
Perfect. All right. Awesome. Um, because I am. Well, it, if there's, yeah. Yeah, because mm -hmm. I am facilitating uh, the next one, I probably do want to take a quick water break and just get some uh, water to drink. But I'll definitely um, be on the on the next session. Yes, perfect. Then we will all see y'all at the event storming starting at 1125. Go get your water, Charles. All right, awesome. Thank you. Y'all have a good one. Thanks, y'all. See you at the next one.